course on statistical mechanics, uh, we will be talking about uh, quantum statistics or quantum statistical mechanics. And um, uh, so far we have seen the classical statistical mechanics, the formalism of it which uh, mainly uh, included uh, calculation of the partition function. And uh, from there on one can get the free energy, entropy, specific heat, magnetization, susceptibility, pretty much everything that uh, an experiment or a physical system can give uh, about it itself. So, we have seen a number of such systems and uh, we have calculated various uh, sort of properties, physical properties of uh, these systems. Um, we have not made any mistake and uh, those uh, classical uh, statistical mechanics uh, seem perfectly fine. It is only that at large temperature. Okay? So, the temperature has to be large and in addition to that we will also pose another constraint on the density of particles in, in some time. Uh, but uh, before that, uh, we uh, wanted to study now a quantum stat mech which should include uh, the indistinguishability of particle. So far in classical statistical mechanics, the particles were distinguishable. Each particle uh, of the gas, ideal gas as if they were distinguishable and we could you know identify them either by their name or by their color or by texture or something. Now that is not possible here. Now, we of course did not make a mention of this particle in a gas or that particle in a gas. What we mean by identification or by the distinguishability is that, that uh, if you actually interchange two particles, uh, this is taken as a new state. Okay? And in quantum mechanics, it is not a new state, it only differs by a phase factor and the phase factor could either be 1 or minus 1 and things like that which means that uh, this exchange of two particles in a quantum mechanical system has to be uh, dealt with care and it does not give you a new state of the system or new microstate of the system uh, and it is related to the original state by just a phase factor. Okay? So, this is the uh, crux of indistinguishability that we have to talk about or we have to incorporate in our system and develop the, uh, the quantum statistical mechanics. This is the main idea of quantum statistical mechanics that the indistinguishability was not taken into account in classical mechanics and which was fine uh, as we have said earlier that uh, at large temperature or at very low densities of the particles will show how the density come into the picture. Those uh, things that we have learnt earlier, they all seem fine. Now we have to modify each one of them and uh, incorporate this indistinguishability. Okay? And uh, a step towards that had already been taken by uh, this Sakut-Tetrode equation. So, we will just uh, briefly introduce the Sakut-Tetrode equation or which is a formula for the entropy of an ideal gas, monatomic ideal gas. Uh, but before that, let us uh, you know try to um, go a little uh, history of how uh, quantum mechanics was developed and what necessitated uh, the introduction of quantum ideas which were uh, preliminary done by a large number of people. Um, uh, let us say only we are going to talk about Planck of uh, these uh, very large number of uh, people who have contributed significantly to the development of the subject. So, uh, the way quantum mechanics developed is that uh, there was this uh, uh, black body radiation uh, which was seen that you have the intensity uh, versus the wavelength um, that uh, for uh, these black bodies they seem like this. Uh, which means that um, the intensity of the emitted radiation versus the wavelength of the in, uh, radiation is uh, by it looks like this non monotonic curve that I show here. And um, this was a bit of a surprise because uh, uh, why uh, it shows a non monotonic behavior because this part was nicely explained earlier and this part is nicely explained earlier as well. So, uh, there are two monotonic functions, one we call as a Wien's law, the other is called as a Rallagen's law. And these two uh, actually nicely explain the either the lower lambda region or the higher lambda region, but none of them actually have a upturn 
and going down and so what we are talking about is that you take a metal and you heat it up and initially when you start heating it up it starts getting hot first is become uh, it becomes uh, red hot and then it becomes white hot and so on which means that the intensity of the emitted radiation actually changes its wavelength from uh, some uh, red to blue and so on or to white and so on and so forth. So, that means uh, that this intensity of the emitted radiation versus wavelength when you try to plot it, it shows this formula. And um, so, the Viens and the Rallagin's law, they were unsuccessful in showing the upturn and actually reproducing the experimental observations. And Planck came and fixed it a bit out of desperation and uh, also, you know, by his intuition that what should it be. And he said that, uh, look, I mean, all these, um, the uh, emission or absorption of electromagnetic radiation happens in terms of uh, uh, packets which are uh, called as uh, photons or these uh, these packets or this quantum of this radiation is uh, they are called as photons and uh, so all these exchanges either emission or absorption by any body in presence of an electromagnetic radiation it happens in uh, uh, the unit of h nu or h cross omega and uh, then he wrote down a distribution function uh, which correctly reproduces the intensity of the radiation. So, you calculate the average energy with that distribution. We have seen how average energy is calculated uh, with the aid of a distribution. So, Planck gave you a distribution formula and then you uh, plug in this h cross omega, multiply it by that, by that distribution and integrate over all frequencies uh, or all wavelengths. I mean, frequency and wavelength are related. And then you can get this, uh, you multiply it by the speed of light which is c uh, or the speed of the electromagnetic radiation and you get the intensity. So, the intensity correctly gets reproduced by this and this was a birth of quantum theory. But now, we are uh, not here to discuss really the development of quantum theory, but the Sakut retrode equation which uh, was the first step towards understanding of these uh, indistinguishability of particle and uh, uh, working out the entropy of a monatomic ideal gas correctly uh, by uh, taking into account this indistinguishability. So, that was like the first step which was independent, completely independent of uh, this uh, Planck's uh, radiation formula or Planck's ideas and it is um, uh, also independent of this, uh, you know, the uh, Einstein's uh, concept of quantization uh, for the photoelectric effect and so on. So, it is really an independent effort uh, from the thermodynamic point of view or from the statistical uh, mechanical point of view that such a development uh, had taken place and we will actually talk about this, um, this equation or the formula for the uh, entropy of the monatomic gas. Okay. So, this is not relevant. So, let me uh, just rub it out uh, and let us write down Sakut retrode equation. As the name suggests, um, uh, the two people Sakur and Tetrode, they have uh, independently actually came up with this equation uh, in about 1912. So, it is uh, more than 113 years uh, uh, or 112 years from now. And um, so, what they did was that uh, they uh, wrote down uh, the entropy of, uh, of a gas uh, or monatomic gas. And uh, the way they did it is that uh, they uh, have uh, taken uh, this z which is a function of t, let us write it as beta and this is like sum over k uh, exponential uh, minus beta uh, e k. Uh, I am writing it as e k where e k is equal to uh, h cross square k square over 2 m um, where it is p is equal to h cross k. So, which means that all these uh, things were already uh, you know uh, in place uh, and these uh, the fact that we are using h cross there was a hint. Uh, in fact, it was initially developed from the micro canonical perspective. Uh, however, we are doing it um, from the canonical point of view. 
So, uh, once you uh, write this down and have to evaluate it, what you do is that you uh, convert it into an integral and um, you write this down as e to the power minus beta e k and then you have a d k um, and uh, this is nothing but equal to v over 2 pi whole cube and uh, sorry whole cube and a 4 pi square and then you have a 0 to infinity and you have a k square e to the power minus beta h cross square k square over 2 m and a d k. Okay. Uh, and um, really there is uh, nothing new that we have done, we have simply uh, trying to calculate the canonical partition function and uh, once uh, we do that, I will not show you uh, this derivation, but you, you can do it yourself, this is very simple. Uh, this is um, you know a double derivative of the Gaussian formula that we have already given. So, what we can uh, say is that if you have a quantity like this uh, x square e to the power minus x square or alpha x square say alpha x square dx from uh, say 0 to infinity or minus infinity to plus infinity. We should put a factor of half because we have already halved the um, this interval and it is a d 2 d alpha 2 uh, and then we have a exponential minus alpha x square d x 0 to um, infinity and this is nothing but root over pi over alpha okay, uh, with this half factor included there. So, we can we can do these um, integral and uh, can uh, land up with this uh, simple formula for n particles. So, for uh, so this for one particle, so for n particles. Now, uh, there is a correction factor that uh, they uh, this occurrent retro they introduced which uh, gives a v to the power n and this n factorial um, and then a 2 pi m k t divided by h square whole to the power 3 n by 2. Okay. Uh, so, this is the total partition function and you can write it as a, uh, the one particle partition function. So, this is the uh, canonical partition function uh, where uh, there is a, a permutation uh, uh, this uh, n factorial being used and um, uh, this is just to make sure that uh, each of those exchanges of particle does not give you a a distinct state, but it is actually the same state with some phase factor. So, this n factorial cuts down the number of permutations uh, possible for such uh, uh, for such exchanges. Uh, and because these exchanges are included here, this uh, should correspond or rather should take into account the indistinguishability of particles and should give you the correct uh, uh, formula for any of these uh, uh, parameters that you are interested in, uh, particularly the entropy that they were interested in in the uh, quantum mechanical limit. Okay. So, um, again uh, you can use f equal to uh, minus k t log z uh, and one can find out what the uh, free energy is which comes out as minus n k t uh, log of uh, v over n and a plus a 3 by 2 uh, log of t plus uh, 1 plus a 3 by 2 log of this is just uh, writing it uh, taking this log and, and so on and uh, there is a h square and uh, there is a big bracket here. So, that is the free energy that one gets and um, uh, you can also write down the partition function uh, which you can do it either by uh, uh, you know from the uh, this z itself or what you can do is that you know that this is nothing but equal to 3 by 2 n k t um, and uh, then of course, uh, your s is equal to e um, u minus f by t. Uh, u minus f by t and this gives you a nice formula which is uh, a correct formula because of the reason that we have seen last day. So, this is v over n 
uh, plus uh, 3 by 2 uh, log of uh, 2 pi m k t um, and h square plus a 5 by 2 and so on. So, this is the uh, formula for that and then uh, s over n k or which is n k is often written as r the universal gas constant is equal to v over n lambda cube uh, plus 5 by 2 and uh, we just write it lambda with a lambda t where lambda t is called as a thermal de Broglie wavelength. wavelength and this has a form which is given by h over root over 2 pi m k t okay. Okay. and this will play some role um, in uh, distinguishing classical stat make from uh, quantum stat make and uh, we will come to that in just a while and um, uh, so the gas is really still classical. However, this n factorial uh, that is included in the partition function um, that excludes over counting that is uh, you know the exchange of particles uh, that is uh, that gives rise to a new state that is not taken into account by this n factorial. Uh, Gibbs paradox uh, it was uh, similar to the spirit of uh, how the Gibbs paradox was fixed which we have uh, discussed last day and in which um, inside the uh, expression for entropy uh, this n was introduced or n factorial was introduced and then uh, Stirling's approximation was applied and which gave rise to the correct formula uh, for the entropy at least in terms of its extensiveness. Okay? And here you can see that the extensiveness is maintained that is if you um, increase n, v and e uh, by a factor by a certain factor. Uh, the entropy uh, enhances or rather gets multiplied by that factor as well. Okay? Uh, so, even though it is like uh, we are doing it on a classical gas, uh, classical ideal gas, but this uh, correct counting is being introduced. So, I write that because it is an important comment. And I told you what this correct counting means that is uh, to uh, you know exclude the over counting of states due to the exchange of the particle. Okay. All right, so this is uh, called as the Sakur uh, tetrode equation and then uh, if you really apply it to uh, the Gibbs paradox uh, with this entropy. So, this entropy let us call it as the equation 1 uh, and this equation 1 would be uh, applied to Gibbs paradox that is uh, mixing of gases so we again just draw that same picture just to remind you that you have uh, uh, n1 v1 t um, and n2 v2 t um, that's there at the same temperature and uh, we uh, are uh, allowing the mixing of the two gases. So, this goes from uh, a situation when the partition is removed and you have uh, still T and then N1 plus N2 and V1 plus V2. Okay. So, this is uh, before mixing and after mixing. We have two ideal gases there uh, in the two chambers and these chambers have these uh, number of particles volume and temperature to be given by N 1 V 1 T and N 2 V 2 T and after they are mixed uh, there is uh, this T is still the same and then N 1 plus N 2 and V 1 plus V 2. So, the available volume is that. So, S initial is uh, uh, we have written it initial uh, even earlier. So, this is equal to um, n 1 r I am just using this uh, the number of moles or you can write it as n k that is so it is n 1 k um, and uh, log of uh, v 1 by n 1 uh, plus 3 by 2 
log t we can um, combine uh, these all the other constant into c. This other constant is also an important quantity in the context because uh, uh, that gives you some S0 or the, uh, the entropy that is you know um, independent of all these relevant parameters. So, uh, this is the, uh, the first one uh, for the first gas and then it is Nk um, and then we have a log of uh, V2 by N2 plus uh, 3 by 2 log of T plus some uh, constant again uh, which is independent of all these things. Uh, so, we can uh, simply add them up and what we get is the n 1 plus n 2 um, k and uh, then we have a, a log of. Uh, now, what we do is that we replace v by, uh, by the equation of state which is uh, p v equal to n k t and uh, then we have this uh, as uh, p uh, k t over p. Um, so, this is uh, replacing this uh, and then we have a, a 3 by 2 ln t plus some constant. Okay. So, this is the initial entropy of the gas that is before mixing and final entropy of the gas which is easy to determine. So, that is corresponding to n 1 plus n 2 number of particles. So, we have n 1 plus n 2 uh, into k and then uh, we have uh, log of uh, v 1 plus v 2 divided by n 1 plus n 2 um, and then uh, you have a 3 by 2 uh, log of t which would remain constant and plus some c. Now, you see that uh, if you again um, use the equation of state that is a pressure at v 1 plus v 2 equal to some um, n 1 plus n 2 k t. Um, then what we see is that we get s initial equal to s final and which I which should get. So, the idea was to start taking care of the over counting right from the beginning at the definition of the um, this uh, partition function and hence arrive at this uh, e expression for entropy which is known as the Sakur tetrod equation and this equation not only has uh, the extensive nature. Now, you see that the extensive nature is inbuilt here and this is called as so equation 1 is called as Sakur tetrod equation. All right. So, uh, this is the equation and uh, as we said that this has been uh, in terms of historical development it has a lot of value because it uh, was uh, developed independently uh, of either Einstein's photoelectric effect or the uh, Planck's distribution formula. It was purely from a thermodynamic point of view. So, either you can uh, do it from a micro canonical perspective here we are shown in from a canonical perspective. Uh, in the micro canonical perspective you would have calculated the number of micro states and take the uh, log of that multiplied by k to get the entropy directly here of course, we had gone through the canonical path and have calculated the entropy. The entropy uh, not only is extensive uh, when you have these two identical gases kept in two chambers and they are allowed to mix there should be no change in entropy which is what. Uh, so, uh, the entropy of mixing which we have defined earlier is 0 which means there is a correct result. Okay. So, in the classical gas if the over counting is properly taken into account it gives you the right entropy and that is what this equation tells you. Okay. All right. So, uh, let us uh, now go to a uh, few uh, differences between um, classical statmec and classical and quantum statmec we will write it together.
Okay, so uh, how do we sort of enumerate the differences and there are many differences in fact uh, and uh, we are just highlighting the some of the important ones and the ones that are of relevance to us. All right. So, um, we need to of course, uh, as you understand uh, some of the uh, classical ideas that we have developed, uh, they need to be modified in order to incorporate the indistinguishability of particles. Okay. Uh, one of the things that is uh, of importance is that uh, the positional coordinate, momenta and energy are quantized in quantum mechanics. Okay. And uh, this quantization should actually take the scale of uh, the Planck's constant h or h cross, uh, so the h cross is equal to h over 2 pi. Okay. So, it is uh, so most of the time you know this is uh, used, this h cross is used or even in some cases h is used. Now, uh, you have to understand that there are quantization in some sense. Um, in even in classical physics, in classical electrodynamics and so on. Uh, if you remember that uh, if you take an organ pipe and uh, uh, want to know the, the frequencies, how the frequencies are uh, they behave or you want to take out different notes in the flute that you are familiar with. And um, uh, there, uh, there are these nu over 2 L or nu over 4 L are the quantization of the frequencies where L is the length of the flute or that organ which emits sound. So, these are quantizations that are there and whenever they you solve a, a differential equation pertaining to certain boundary condition, you are uh, bound to get such uh, you know quantization. If I, if you remember that if you have solved Laplace's equation for say for example, either a dielectric or a magnetic material, uh, you got those results as uh, you know. Uh, these uh, some uh, constants and then uh, some function of r and then some uh, p l cos theta where these are called the legendary polynomials and so on. So, this else each of the allowed else uh, are uh, going to be solutions for this problem. So, uh, a superposition of all of them uh, they are also solutions of the problem. And so, these uh, L equal to 1, uh, so I am particularly talking about this legendary polynomial for the uh, this Laplace's equation. So, it is a P L cos theta where L equal to 0, L equal to 1 or uh, L equal to 2 etcetera, they are allowed solutions and then you can also superpose them to get a, a, a solution which is the most general solution for this particular problem. So, for example, your V of R. Uh, by solving a Laplace's equation, uh, it gives you some form, uh, if I remember it correctly, it is like A L R L plus uh, B L by R L plus 1 and a P L cos theta. And this is a solution for both the electrostatic potential or as a magnetic potential, if you are talking about a magnetic case, magnetic scalar potential. And um, uh, each of these L's or L's can take values as I said uh, 0, 1, 2. So, it seems that there is a quantization or there is a discreteness there as well in the solutions. We are not talking about this kind of discreteness. The discreteness in energy or the discreteness in the angular momentum should carry um, a scale that is uh, equal to the Planck's constant which is uh, h uh, or h cross. Okay. So, that is one important thing. The second important thing is that we know that Q and P can be independently defined in classical mechanics. However, Q and P uh, cannot be independently defined because of the uncertainty relation that we have. So, this delta Q delta P should be of the order of uh, h cross or one can write it a little more correctly as uh, less than h cross by 2. Uh, this has got nothing to do with the accuracy of the experiment, this is very inherent to the system and uh, every uh, canonical, every set of canonical uh, observables have to follow this uncertainty relation, okay. uh, which could be you know uh, j phi or it could be uh, j means the angular momentum and the uh, angle corresponding angle, uh, angular variable rather and the energy and time. So, delta E delta T uh, is uh, again this uh, follows this relation delta E into delta T is equal to or less than equal to h cross by 2 
delta j delta phi where j is uh, uh, angular momentum and phi is angular variable they also would conform to this. So, uh, now let us take an example for uh, say particle in a box. So, uh, we have particle in a box and uh, this is uh, the first uh, thing that you always see. Uh, so, what it says is that the, uh, the potential is 0 inside and these uh, walls are infinitely high. Uh, so, this v equal to actually infinity. So, the, which means that the particle is confined and it cannot uh, escape on either side and while it is inside there is no potential that it feels. Okay? So, it is like a free particle which is allowed to go anywhere between this and it is associated with a wave and so on and then we know that the quantization for this. Uh, comes as uh, p n uh, or the momentum is quantized as uh, 2 pi over L um, n h cross and so on. So, where n is an integer. Okay, um, there is no extra degree of freedom. We actually have lost the uh, position or positional degree of freedom, but it does not matter to us because uh, this n can be actually found out as p n l divided by 2 pi h cross and um, there is no information about q, but when you actually uh, do this sum over n or sum over all the states, we, you can do an integral, integral over this n and uh, this is equal to nothing but, uh, so this l by 2 pi h cross uh, dp and which is nothing but equal to I mean d q d p by h. This is just a simple example for particle in a box where um, even if you do not see the positional degree of freedom that is actually there and uh, this L uh, is uh, you know it takes into account this, um, this positional uh, this uncertainty there and so on. So, in short what we want to say is that if you uh, if you remember that p and q are uh, two points in the, uh, a, a, not two points, just a point in the phase space. In the pq space, uh, there is a point here which is called as p0, q0, okay? and it is a sharply defined point and uh, um, you know we have developed many understanding of how to do an ensemble average or how to define ensembles and uh, how to actually uh, reconcile the statement of Lewell's theorem, etc., all in this uh, description. And so, uh, because of this uh, uncertainty relation, now this point actually acquires a bit of fuzziness and it is, let me draw it with a color and this is that is now uh, the area of this uh, fuzzy uh, object which now looks squarish. Uh, is uh, a multiplication of delta q and delta p which is of the order of h cross. So, uh, that is where uh, the correspondence between classical mechanics and uh, quantum mechanics they are, uh, that is how they are established that a point now becomes fuzzy and acquires certain uh, region of space with an area equal to h or h cross. Okay. All right, so, uh, let us uh, look at some more uh, differences uh, with them and uh, with between the two and uh, let us just talk about um, this uh, two very importantly which we have told many times earlier and as well as today is the indistinguishability of particles. So, exchange of two particles does not give rise to a new state. Okay? This has to be properly taken into account. Okay? In classical mechanics it was uh, or classical statistics it was taken as uh, it, it, it would have given rise to a new state and so on. Okay. So, uh, even within that this exchange statistics, this is called as the exchange statistics. So, one needs to define an exchange statistics and uh, this exchange statistics gives rise to two kinds of particles. Uh, one is called as a fermions, which upon 
changing uh, their mutual positions, they pick up a negative sign uh, that is a phase which is equal to pi and there are other kind of particles which do not pick up a sign and um, they or rather this pick up a phase which is equal to 0. So, this uh, 0 and pi phase because of the interchange of particles that give rise to two kinds of uh, you know particles quantum particles that we have to talk about and these two type of quantum particles have very different properties like for example, fermions obey um, Pauli exclusion principle which means that no two fermions uh, with the same quantum number can occupy a given energy state. So, this is called as a Pauli exclusion principle and because of that um, you know are picking up a negative sign one can write down the wave function a many particle wave function for the fermions as a Slater determinant we will see all of that and um, bosons actually uh, have no problem in occupying any number basically no constraint on the number of particles occupying um, single particle states. So, uh, this is a more stringent condition because you see that if two fermions cannot allow uh, one given energy state that is like putting a hard core condition that one electron if it is already there or one fermion if it is already there electrons are fermions. Um, uh, it is already there then another uh, electron or another fermion cannot come. So, that puts a constraint and this constraint gives rise to a large number of very interesting properties uh, of uh, for fermions which are not observed for bosons. Um, on the other hand since bosons actually uh, like being together in fact, we will sh show that this number fluctuation uh, for bosons they indicate that they actually like being together. This gives rise to another very important uh, phenomena which has been observed experimentally called as a Bose-Einstein condensation. So, they will all be part of our discussion of statistical mechanics uh, we just want to mention um, it uh, here. So, uh, these obey Fermi Dirac statistics and these obey Bose Einstein statistics. And uh, what could be uh, more differences or other differences? Um, one can really think of that that in classical mechanics one really talks about uh, solving uh, Newton's equation of motion. So, Newton's laws um, and they would really mean uh, all the three laws that we are aware of and this means that f is equal to uh, you know d p d t uh, uh, equal to m d 2 x d t 2. And this means that uh, if you solve this uh, differential equation by integrating it twice uh, you can get x of t if you know the nature of f that is acting on the system. And this is uh, what is uh, done in the, the numerical procedure is followed in uh, what is called as a molecular dynamics uh, simulation and so on. So, one really uh, sort of builds up uh, x 1 t 1 at x 2 t 2. Uh, and all the way till x n t n. So, that uh, sort of uh, you know uh, fixes the trajectory of the particle uh, that it takes uh, in the influence or under the effect of this uh, force that acts on the system. On the other hand in quantum mechanics one talks about Schrodinger equation. We are of course, talking about non-relativistic uh, mechanics. So, where uh, it is written as minus h square by 2 m um, and uh, we write it in three dimensions. So, it is del square psi it is called a Laplacian operator plus v of r uh, psi psi is a function of a vector r uh, and vector r can be x y z or r theta phi depending on 
what kind of symmetry uh, the system has and this is E psi r. Uh, uh, you can write it as uh, the time dependent equation is written as uh, i h cross del del t of psi r. And um, one solves this equation and we are only um, sort of familiar with uh, solving it uh, you know uh, in known situations where there is a closed solution uh, the uh, time independent part of it mostly. And that is what you see in the first course of quantum mechanics that you solve it for a number of problems such as particle in a box, such as a hydrogen atom, such as harmonic oscillator and maybe um, more uh, sort of systems such as say um, linear potential uh, instead of a harmonic potential, a linear potential which gives rise to airy functions and so on. And uh, some of these things are uh, easier to do uh, using an approximate method. Uh, for example, this uh, linear potential or a slowly varying potential is usually done using uh, WKB approximations. Uh, so, we can solve this uh, in a variety of situations and in a very uh, different type of arbitrary situation even this one particle Schrodinger equation is not solvable and um, uh, one may resort to uh, uh, techniques uh, numerical techniques to solve this differential equation once again just like the Newton's laws. And uh, one finally gets what is known as psi uh, r and in this particular case it is uh, if you take a time dependence this is really a, a psi r t. Um, uh, v is taken to be time independent uh, in the sense the potential is also time dependent uh, then of course, uh, you cannot solve this equation uh, unless you have a very specific kind of time dependence which is uh, you know uh, uh, periodic time dependence. Then there are different methods of solving this things called as a Floquet formalism and so on and so forth. Okay. So, uh, what you find out is that you find out uh, this uh, psi of r t by itself uh, which is the solution of this uh, differential equation by itself psi of r t does not have any physical significance okay. uh, and it only acquires physical significance if you talk about the quantity called as a probability density. and uh, Um, which is given as psi of r t mod square or probability current density which is um, defined as say j which is like uh, r t um, and this is uh, if I remember the prefactors correctly it is like this. So, it is a psi star r t r del psi r t uh, minus del psi r t. So, psi star where uh, psi is the wave function which is in general complex and by itself as I said psi is just a mathematical function. Um, it has no physical meaning, but when you talk about this mod psi square, it acquires a physical meaning that denotes the probability of finding a particle in certain region of space and time which is r and t and one can also calculate the um, this uh, probability current density if you know this psi and psi star. So, psi is in general complex as you can understand that. Um, so, that is why uh, psi and psi star could be uh, distinct. Uh, which will tell you that uh, the probability current density would exist if psi is completely real in certain situation which it uh, does as you solve uh, this particle uh, barrier penetration problem. If you have uh, the wave function to be completely real uh, there is no current associated with it and it is called as an evanescent wave instead of a propagating wave. Okay. So, uh, another very important thing is that uh, two kinds of averages appear. What do I mean by two kind of averages? One is of course, the quantum mechanical average which is the um, uh, we will just see in a while that what is a quantum mechanical average. 
and we also have a statistical average or the ensemble average okay statistical or the ensemble average so um, instead of just one average which is ensemble average in classical statistical mechanics here one needs to worry about two kinds of averages or there is a double averaging that uh, you know uh, comes into picture uh, where the quantum mechanical average or the expectation values of operators they also have to be taken into account and as well you need to average over the ensembles okay so this is uh, something that we are going to discuss now uh, let us uh, see that what is the uh, limiting case of quantum me statistical mechanics or quantum mechanics, quantum stat mech maybe. That is uh, the ones that we have learned so far are they all wrong or uh, in some limiting case it is true. We have said that in the limiting case it is true, but let us see it more uh, carefully. And uh, so, we write this uh, delta x delta p uh, is equal to uh, of the order of h cross, you can write it h cross by 2 or less than h cross by 2, they mean the same thing. So, uh, say this one uh, delta x for a particle, okay, for a point particle or for a particle with some uh, finite dimensions what could be a uh, delta x. So, uh, if you think of just a small uh, you know billiard ball like structure which has a radius r. So, uh, the maximum uh, uncertainty or the maximum uncertainty in the measurement of the position is the radius itself. Okay? So, uh, this delta x the maximum delta x is a say for example, is like the r which is the size of the object. It can be a cubic object or it can be a spherical object just for you know convenience we have taken it to be a, a spherical object, but it can be um, as a cubic object as well. And this one uh, this p uh, is the momentum which is uh, you know. Uh, so, uh, the classical limit demands that these quantities uh, should be much much greater than r into p should be much much greater than h cross right because um, uh, if h cross is comparable to this product then we are in the quantum regime and we are uh, talking about the classical limit of this so r cross r dot p should be equal to um, you know uh, uh, h uh, so r uh, you know should be much much greater than h over p or h cross over p it doesn't matter so this is uh, uh, this h over p is of the order of lambda, where lambda is called as the de Broglie wavelength. So, what de Broglie proposed is that uh, when it was fairly clear uh, at the beginning, you know, uh, era of quantum development of quantum physics that. Uh, there are uh, particle descriptions and there are wave descriptions of the same experiment. Like for example, photons uh, they undergo interference experiments, Young's double slit experiments or diffraction which show up the wave phenomena whereas, there are Compton effect and there are photoelectric effect which shows the uh, particle phenomena because you apply the conservation of energy and so on as if they are like uh, hard billiard balls they are uh, electron is uh, colliding with uh, photons or uh, you know uh, in uh, situations uh, where they are really taken as hard spheres and uh, you talk about uh, you know uh, the energy and momentum conservation relation uh, of course, we talk about uh, these are elastic scatterings and so there has to be a reconciliation between the wave description and particle description and de Broglie came up exactly with that when he said that the momentum of a particle p which is say equal to mv in the non relativistic case uh, should be uh, related to the wavelength of the wave through this relation okay so lambda is equal to h over p is what he said and uh, this is called as a de Broglie wavelength 
So it's h over p if we ignore this h cross and h which is simply a factor of 2 pi then this is really equal to much greater than the wavelength associated with the wave. So the size of the particle has to be very large as compared to a wavelength that could be associated with the particle. So this is the classical you know limit. Now if you think of um, gas or uh, a sort of a system um, and uh, try to fill up the system by uh, all these hard spheres or for just for a moment think that we have cubes which have a volume equal to r cube and uh, we need n such r cubes there could be a four third pack factor if you uh, you know take into account uh, the sphere but let us forget that uh, and so r cube into n should be equal to v. So, we have a system with a volume v and we are uh, completely filling it up with uh, uh, objects that have volume r cube and n of them that are going to fill uh, this entire volume. So, this tells you that r is equal to uh, which is v by n uh, to the power one third. So, this is r to the I mean r equal to v by n to the power one third. So, this is v by n is nothing but inverse of the density. So, uh, there is a, a density to the power uh, minus one third that comes here and um, this when you apply equipartition theorem. So, you have a 1 over 2 m uh, and a p square uh, this is equal to some um, e which is equal to some 3 by 2 k t and that tells you that uh, this p is equal to like a root over 3 m k t. So, uh, this lambda that you get is h over p and this is like root over 3 m k t. Well, we have written it with uh, the thermal de Broglie which is slightly different than that and uh, so the where classical uh, limit is valid when this v by n whole to the power one third is much much greater than a this uh, particular thing. Okay. So, this is what we have told. So, this uh, condition translates to so r much much greater than lambda uh, that translates to so we have calculated r which is v by n whole to the power one third and we have also calculated lambda which is h divided by uh, 3 m k t. So, putting it into this r much much greater than lambda we get root over uh, h divided by 3 m k t. Okay. So, this tells one thing that uh, uh, the classical limit is valid valid 1 when temperature is high which means the thermal uh, effects dominate over the quantum effects and the other is that we have uh, the density to be small. Okay. So, the density is uh, here uh, which is um, n divided by v is equal to the density. So, when the density is small that is inverse of this is small then of course, this is uh, going to be uh, uh, valid uh, or when temperature is large. So, the limit uh, of the quantum uh, statistical mechanics is the classical statistics. So, classical statistical mechanics is obtained as a limiting case of a quantum stat mech. Okay. So, which means that at very large temperature the distinguishability goes away and the particles become indistinguishable okay. and uh, at very low temperature uh, the indistinguishability sets in which means that the particles are uh, to be treated alike and you cannot you know give a, a sort of name texture or color to each of the particle that are under consideration. Okay. So, a uh, little into the, um, the quantum mechanical ensemble theory, uh, let us start this and then carry on uh, later. So, a uh, quantum mechanical
ensemble theory. So what it means is that um, we are going to develop uh, these uh, two averages that are uh, very important uh, which we have said the quantum mechanical average and the statistical average and to see that um, and let us write down a wave function uh, psi of uh, say k r t that satisfies this Schrodinger equation which is h psi k r t. Um, and i h cross uh, psi k r t well I mean r t uh, this is r t and a dot. So, it is d psi d t. So, a psi dot means d psi d t and uh, we have used this Dirac's notation where these um, the vector or the wave function is written um, as a ket and uh, this uh, is of course the Schrodinger equation. So, we will write it in short uh, called as Schrodinger equation. Okay. Uh, so, now uh, we can introduce basis functions of course, you have to do a bit of reading on this what are basis functions, but I can tell you that all these Hamiltonian etcetera they are all matrices and in order to write a matrix uh, you need a basis. Okay. Uh, if I uh, uh, say at the end of the course when uh, marks are awarded uh, there is a uh, you know there is a row and there is a column and uh, the row say represents the number of courses that people have done in the class and say the, uh, the column is the uh, roll numbers of students. So, that gives an identification that which student has got what uh, grade or what number how much he, he or she uh, got in a given course. Okay. So, this is called as a basis of this matrix. So, if you just get a matrix it has no meaning unless you know what the x and y axis they represent this is called as a basis. So, we introduce this basis functions where we write this psi k. Um, let me just write only the time uh, uh, variation and uh, suppress this r, but there of course, it is there. So, this is equal to a uh, sum over a n k um, and a t and these phi n. Uh, uh, this is a uh, important step in the sense that we have expanded uh, psi in terms of completeness of states. So, these are uh, you know uh, represent complete states. So, this is the basis okay? and the basis is an orthonormal basis which means that each of phi n and phi m uh, they follow this delta n m where delta n m is Kronecker delta which is equal to 0 if no n is not equal to m and which is equal to 1 if n is equal to m. And these are the coefficients that uh, explicitly carry the time dependence and the basis is most of the time taken as uh, a time independent. In fact, it is favorable to uh, talk about a time independent basis and uh, transfer all the time dependence to these coefficients. And um, if uh, you have this, uh, then uh, you have this a n k uh, t is written as uh, this uh, phi n. Uh, so, this that uh, the conjugate phi n and psi k of t and so on. So, this is uh, the definition of these coefficients which are obtained by this inner product. This is called as the inner product where you have taken a conjugate phi n um, and uh, taken it with uh, multiplied it with a ket n. So, it is a bra phi n ket n in the Dirac notation. Okay. So, we can uh, also represent the Schrodinger equation in terms of uh, the coefficient. So, let us write Schrodinger equation uh, in terms of the coefficients. And uh, this is uh, quite uh, interesting and uh, you need to sort of you know do it carefully. So, when I say uh, Schrodinger equation. So, it, it means that we have to take a time derivative because a, a right hand side had a time derivative this is equal to 
for this I, I just multiplied that equation of motion by i h cross for reasons that you know that this i h cross is there uh, in the right hand side of the equation. So, uh, we have a phi n and a psi k. So, we uh, would uh, follow a chain rule where we first uh, take the time um, evolution or take a, a ddt on this uh, left one, keep the right one fixed, uh, do not do anything on it and then uh, take the uh, time derivative on the right one and do not do anything on the left one. So, this is what one needs to be done, but then we know that uh, the uh, left one that is phi n dot is equal to 0 because we have assumed that the base is to be time independent. And that tells us that the only term that survives is this psi k dot uh, t and uh, this is nothing but psi k dot from the uh, equation that we see here. So, this is including the i h cross becomes equal to a phi n and uh, h uh, acting on the psi k of t. So, the equation of motion of uh, these coefficient a n k dot is nothing but equal to phi n. Uh, so, the matrix element of h between these bases and the end state. Okay. So, this is the equation of motion or which is also uh, an alternate form for the uh, Schrodinger equation. Okay. And this can be uh, written as uh, uh, the, the last thing can be written as. So, I will continue writing it as uh, uh, a uh, dot uh, n k uh, t this is equal to a uh, phi n h uh, sum over m. Now, do not use the same index as you have done it for the left one. So, introduce another dummy index because uh, just by having n you are only talking about the diagonal uh, elements. Uh, you need to also talk about the off diagonal elements and this is like a m k t and then uh, you have a phi of m. Okay. So, uh, this is uh, the form uh, that we want and uh, what we uh, can write here is that we have a phi n. Uh, h phi m uh, and we have uh, a m k that tells you this gives you a h n m which is the matrix element of the Hamiltonian operator between the n and m basis these uh, between these basis states n and m and this is equal to a m k. Okay. So, h n m is nothing but this. All right. So, this is uh, of course, that gives you that uh, a n uh, k r t um, this uh, sum over n um, for uh, this square is equal to 1. This you can check very easily that this is equal to 1 because uh, you just have to uh, go back to this expression, uh, the expression that you see here and then you take a mod square of that and then um, you know use the uh, completeness of the basis that is uh, your phi n phi n should be equal to 1 and also the size to be um, properly normalized. So, this is equal to 1 and this is for all k. Okay. So, this is for all k and uh, one can then um, introduce a density operator this is important and this density operator will directly give you an idea that. Um, that there are two averages involved and the density operator is written as uh, m n r t which is equal to 1 over n sum over uh, k equal to 1 to n um, and uh, a m t um, with the k index here and because you are summing over k. Uh, star of that and uh, okay, so the star is here um, a n star uh, k and a t. So, this is called as a density matrix which is the product of these um, the coefficients which are a m k and uh, a n k um, and so on. So, this is sum over uh, k 
and um, so clearly uh, this matrix element is really the classical uh, uh, or the ensemble average. Okay, so, rho m n is the ensemble average which you see here that there is a sum over k 1 to n and then you are dividing it by n which is definitely nothing but uh, an average. But then you also see that a n t these you see as a quantum mechanical average. Okay? Um, so, this or, or say for example, this is a quantum mechanical average. So, this tells you that there are two averages involved, one involving the statistical average and the other the, uh, the quantum average. Uh, so, there are two averages that are involved. And uh, little more on the density operator, it tells you that uh, it is very clear that you can see uh, that uh, this rho of uh, n n the diagonal element. So, the trace of the density matrix should be equal to 1 and if you really want to see the uh, equation of motion uh, we call it E O m. So, E O m stands for equation of motion. So, E O m of rho uh, that gives you that i h cross uh, rho m n uh, dot t which is equal to 1 over n sum over k equal to 1 to n and we have a i h cross a m k uh, t and uh, a uh, n star uh, well the star should be outside star t. So, this is uh, one term and then there will be another term that is taking a um, you know uh, here they are taking a time derivative and now we will take the time derivative on the other thing with that is a n. So, a um, dot k star n t and so on. So, uh, this is and then again using the Schrodinger equation we can write this as k equal to 1 to n um, and then we have a sum over l. Uh, h m l, I am just using the uh, Schrodinger equation here, uh, this is a l k of t. So, this part is written as this uh, h m l and a k l of t and uh, a n k star of t and then um, there is a, a minus a m k of t and sum over l h n l um, a l k star of t. That is uh, for uh, this one and this one that is written as this term. Okay? And uh, this is uh, now simple. Uh, so, there is a sum over l and we have a h m l rho l n t because that is the definition of rho. This is rho and minus rho m l and uh, t in h uh, l m. Now, this is nothing but the commutator of h and rho both as an operator. Okay? So, it is a commutator of h and rho. And just for your convenience, the commutator is uh, for two operators is written as a b minus b a. Okay? And the reason that this is not equal to 0 is that they are not uh, numbers, that, but they are operators and here they are operators as well. And this is uh, reminiscent of nothing but the, the Liouville's theorem uh, in classical uh, statistical mechanics, which we have derived earlier which is del rho del t plus uh, you know the h and rho. Okay. Um, so, this is this is the nothing but the Poisson bracket. So, this is uh, Liouville's theorem uh, 
So, that tells you that if uh, there is no explicit time dependence of rho on t, uh, then of course, uh, the Poisson bracket vanishes and, um, and of course, also rho is not a function of h itself. So, in that case the Poisson bracket vanishes and importantly the uh, expectation value of any operator which is say O, say the any operator O is actually nothing but 1 uh, by n k equal to 1 to n we just simply write down what we have written earlier. Uh, so, uh, this operator uh, between the states uh, and this is nothing but equal to 1 by n sum over k equal to 1 to n and there is um, a sum over m n uh, and this is equal to a n k uh, star uh, well a m k and o uh, o m n that is the matrix element of the operator where o m n is nothing but equal to um, this phi uh, m o phi n. Okay. And uh, so, this is nothing but uh, you know uh, this in terms of the density matrix it is a rho m n um, and o m n and this is equal to sum over m uh, rho and o both are operators. So, I just write it with uh, operator uh, here and this is m m and there is nothing but trace of rho o. Okay. So, let me not write it uh, rho with uh, this thing because we have not been writing it, but o is an operator. So, this o can be expressed in terms of or rather this can be calculated for uh, that is expectation value of any operator can be calculated uh, uh, using the density uh, matrix which is trace of uh, rho o divided by trace of rho. Okay. And that involves both uh, the statistical average, the ensemble average and the quantum mechanical average. So, we will stop here and carry on with uh, discussions on um, uh, the ensembles uh, in quantum statistical mechanics and uh, the applications uh, thereafter of those uh, you know what we develop as the formalism thank you mm -hmm.